Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming back. Really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. So there was a couple of topics that I wanted to finish up in a little more detail. So we can start with some of the things that I'd like to start with is lab testing. All right. And I want to know what kind of, so I'll give you the background. This is an important topic that I want to discuss because I had Tommy Wood, who's an MD, PhD. I don't know if you're aware of him. Are you familiar with him? Okay. Yeah. In fact, I think we've done at least one podcast together on, um, on Chris Kelly's show way back in the day. Right. So he worked with him before Chris Kelly in, I forgot the exact name of the company, but he was doing this functional testing. And at a certain point, he was really into it. And he left there. And I recently spoke to him. And he claimed that after going through a whole rabbit hole, he came out the other side thinking that most of these functional tests were bogus. That includes like most of the Genova tests, the Great Plains labs, the Dutch tests. He thought that there's some benefit in in some tests, but you know, ninety eight percent of it was bogus. Uh, he gave a can few you, examples. Can you define bogus, and actually, yeah, if you could give a couple examples, that'd be great. Yeah. So, for example, he he like for the organic acids test, he said that the the eight deoxyguanine test is a valid one and it's a good marker for oxidative stress but that's kind of like the exception to the rule in the organic acids test and the organic acids in general are pretty unstable and you could test the same person twice in the same time and they'll get very different results he claims and so it's not a a reliable test he says Um, unstable does he mean that uh whether you're excreting the compound from one hour to the next is going to vary a lot? Or does he mean that they're not stable enough to last while the sample is in storage? So what they're measuring is completely inaccurate. I'm not sure exactly. I think he thinks that, I mean, I I'm, I don't want to talk for him, but I, I assume that he thinks that they fluctuate too much throughout the day. And what is claimed of being tested, like these tests are legitimately used in some capacity to diagnose rare diseases, let's say, right? Uh, that's kind of how they were. If you look at any kind of research on these tests, it's mostly for that. And so when I asked my science team to go ahead and look at research related to these organic acid tests, they came back and said, there isn't really much on it. It's all hypothesis driven. And you know, it could be hypothesis driven and true, or it could be hypothesis driven and not true. I think you mean it's speculative. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say that. You could say uh, that, that I mean, could be a speculative whether it is a useful marker for that for that thing. That speculative, yeah. Basically, somebody created a hypothesis or speculation uh, that this marker means that if you have lower high levels of this, it means this. So that's a speculation. It's not proven. We don't know that. Pretty sure I mean, it, I'm pretty sure I know what you mean. Right. Yeah, that that's the impression I got from Tommy Wood, and he seemed to think that even as a hypothesis or a speculation, it like he always knew it was a hypothesis or a speculation, but he seemed to come out on the other side of it thinking that what he saw as the results weren't matching up with the hypothesis even like even as an n equals one you could say okay if i'm deficient on all these markers and i take these supplements and i have no difference whatsoever then it it harms the hypothesis on some level let's say that's like for example yeah i I got i got what you're saying and i i think i'm going to come down somewhere in the middle on this and actually i'm i'm i've been very deep in the weeds on this for years uh so it would probably be very interesting to have a discussion with tommy about this at some point but uh, so first of all, um, my, what I what I've done with nutritional testing 
where, and actually it was, it was Chris Kelly who asked me to do this. Uh, I, he asked me to, to make a PDF, like a one page PDF of all the markers of nutritional status, uh, and the ranges for them. And as I was doing it, I realized he was like, I'll pay for this. And I'm like, if I got someone asking me to pay for something for me, it's probably a useful thing. Right. So I start putting it together and I realized that there's, and I was calling it a cheat sheet. This became testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, which is my comprehensive guide for lab testing. And so as I was putting it together, I'm like, there's no way on earth to make anything that has any validity that involves just looking at a PDF, uh, one page PDF and using a cheat sheet in that way. Because what you have to do is you have to consider the signs and symptoms and you have to consider the, uh, you know, the well-validated markers, but you have to, con and then you have to consider how they respond to the things uh, that you're doing in the strategies to, to improve them, right? So um, even with a very well-validated marker, so for example, you're not going to find a, a better validated marker of vitamin A status than serum retinol, even though there are numerous problems with it. Um, but you know, you're going to have vitamin A deficient people who are in the range and you're going to have people who are out of the range who have no problem. And, uh, you know, this is even actually, this is a better example would be plasma zinc. So I recently did a video, um, on plasma zinc as a marker of zinc status in response to someone who just kept supplementing more zinc, the z plasma zinc just kept going down and down and down and down. Um, and you know, the reality is that hormones can affect plasma zinc, eating can affect plasma zinc and stress, all kinds of stress can affect plasma zinc, but plasma zinc is still the most well-validated marker of zinc status bar none, um, and is essential to measuring zinc status. So even if you're using something that is absolutely completely well-validated, you will always have exceptions to the rule because there are many things that can affect the marker besides the nutritional status. And you must always look at how the signs and symptoms are lining up with the marker and how the person is responding to changes that are hypothesis driven around the marker. So I, I, I disagree that, that your that the hypothesis can ever be so strong and so well validated that it's not a hypothesis anymore. It's always a hypothesis that a marker might mean something. You develop a strategy around it. You try to fix it. You see how the improvements in the person's health respond and how the marker responds. And in that process, you you test your hypothesis and you either confirm or refute it and you go back to the drawing board if needed. Um, now, if you get into the uh, the organic acids and stuff like that, uh, it's first of all, it's it's straight up not true that these are only validated for for markers of rare diseases that's 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 false um so for example it is very extremely well validated that urinary beta hydroxy isobalerate is a better more sensitive uh marker of biotin status than is uh than is serum biotin um and so it's and it's impossible to get urinary beta hydroxy isobalerate from lab core or quest except as a urinary organic acid panel that is designed for testing children for rare causes of neurological diseases. That doesn't change the fact that in the literature, there's an enormous amount of, of literature on, the, on validation tests, taking healthy people, putting that, giving them transient biotin deficiency and watching how markers respond. And urinary beta hydroxy isobalerate is the best marker bar none. In large studies of healthy people, however, the sensitivity declines to 90%, which means that 10% of people are always going to be missed by this. Uh, but it remains the case that the easiest way to get uh, beta hydroxy isobalerate tested is in a Genova ion panel. Um, and so, you know, unfor unfortunately, that's, that's the case. I mean, you could get, uh, you could get LabCorp Quest and, um, you know, you're not going to have insurance pay for it or whatever. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. But some of these markers are best uh, tested after an amino acid challenge. So, uh, beta hydroxy isovalerate would be best tested after a leucine challenge, but no one's test is designed for that. So Genova is not going to give you a reference range for it. And LabCorp is not going to give you a reference range for it. Quest isn't going to give you a reference range for it. And that's because 
none of the companies, whether they are uh, whether they are the most utilized in mainstream medicine or they're functional, none of them uh, seem to be familiar with the literature on on using these markers for nutritional status enough to give any guidance on using the markers after an amino acid challenge. So, for example, um, the bar none, the best markers of vitamin B6 deficiency are not plasma B6, and they're not urinary pyridoxic acid, although that's a good marker. Um, they are urinary xanthorinate, kynorinate, and quinolinate after a tryptophan challenge. And no one's testing them after a tryptophan challenge. And if they're high without a tryptophan challenge, it probably indicates a B6 deficiency, although your B6 deficiency might reflect that you're deficient in B6, or it might reflect that you have inflammation or estrogen that is driving up the tryptophan catabolism pathway that elevates those markers and increasing your need for B6. But guess what? You put people on old style classic birth control from the 1960s and 70s, and their xanthorenic goes through the roof. If you give them 20 milligrams of B6, it disappears. So even in those cases, you are probably legitimately causing an increased need for B6. And even though the fundamental cause isn't B6 deficiency, it's estrogen. So number one is super interesting fact that you're saying birth control increases the need for vitamin B6, correct? Oh, sure. That's been known for decades. That is interesting. I did not know that. Number I will, two, yeah, I will yeah. say that the old birth control had higher estrogen that 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 is worse in that respect than the modern birth control. But birth control increases any estrogen increases your need for B six. It doesn't matter if it's post ovulation or or pregnancy or or HRT or birth control. Okay, this is a super super important question with all these alternative tests, whether it's Genova, Great Plains, Dutch. What's bullshit? What's speculative? What's not bullshit? And what's you, clear you is you have that same problem with LabCorp and Quest, but yeah, I think it's less less bad. I'll, I'll I'll tell you what I like about LabCorp or whatever. I like tests that I can look up on the research and see what this means, how you can modify it, what the risks are for this thing. So if I have a lot high lipoprotein A, there's tons of studies on that. What that means, um. You know, whatever lab tests that I do, I generally do them because there's some scientific study that says people who have this marker and, and generally I'll, I'll, you know, e either it's a marker or it could be causative, but people who have this marker have higher risk for X, Y, and Z. And that could be high sensitivity CRP or a whole, any marker that I'm testing is going to have a very clear reason why I want that marker tested and there's going to be evidence behind it. You can, you can put caveats on everything. Well, if, you know, serum this, serum that, well, it's only, it only be bad if this is also bad or whatever. I'm talking about in general, there's totally research behind it. There's Mendelian randomization studies behind it. There's uh, genetic predispositions behind it, which I think makes it more useful. So whenever I get a marker tested, I also look at my genetic predisposition. So that tells me uh, more if it's more environmental based that uh, this genetic marker is high uh, or or not. And, and actually, that's been super, super helpful looking at my genetic predisposition and my actual labs. And so far, they all have lined up in terms of like I've I've done lab testing for 11 years. And so I've sold, uh, uh, you know, I've saved a whole bunch of old labs. And I found that, you know, sometimes something's high if I have a genetic predisposition that's typical or low, I'll look back at my results 11 years ago and I'll see that, oh, you know, 11 years ago it was typical or low and this is changing. So there's a lot of interesting things there, but uh, just to get back to the big picture, um, I love labs that I can do research on and find out what this means. And that's kind of how we built uh, the lab analyzer within self-decode because we have scientists, they know how to read research and they look at all the research on what this lab means and what you can do to modify it. What are the risks are? What is the optimal range? When you get to these kinds of tests, they're definitely more speculative, right? Now, not every single component of the test. I think you brought up some good examples that you said, well, if you want to check biotin, actually urinary biotin, uh, urinary isovaleric butyrate, whatever, 
uh, is going to be a better test. Great. That's the stuff I want to know. I want to know you like I want to I want to know all the stuff that's that's legit. That's even better than just testing, you know, serum biotin. And in that way, I could say, OK, I'm going to look at I'm going to make sure I, I look at these results and weight them more than just the other ones that are, you know, more speculative. So what's clear to me at this stage is that there's a lot of stuff. There's there's stuff that's BS. There's stuff that's speculative and there's stuff that's true. And I think what people want to know is really like, what is the deal? What's true? What's speculative? What is uh, BS? Um, I would be shocked if if all the markers were just like good. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if someone wants if someone wants that for nutrition, they they should get my my testing nutritional status the ultimate cheat sheet because that that that's the whole point of it. I want to say I want to say two two more things on the on the topic of the testing. One is that uh, rare diseases are not rare. So if you take, um, in fact, I don't know if you can, if you can, yeah, if you look uh, above me to the right of my degree, I don't know if this is mirrored or not, but anyway, the red book, if you trace, trace it over to the other side, you'll see one or two books in from the end is the Sadubre Inborn Errors of Metabolism book, which is like the Bible of these rare genetic diseases that would be probably used as a textbook for them in a med school class on it. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that's clear if you read the introduction is that no one has any clue what the prevalence of rare, and we're not talking about, we're not talking about, uh, you know, common SMPs. We're talking about like private mutations that are 50% of them. So they're, they're just not in the database or otherwise very rare genetic mutations. No one has any clue what the what the uh, prevalence of late, very late onset, meaning like thirty years old, forty years old, uh, versions of these are because they are they are never diagnosed. They're almost never diagnosed, and they're you know if you have a genetic mutation that causes seizures in a six month old infant, and you can get a quote unquote benign version of it that doesn't cause seizures until they're three then of course you can get a version of it that just makes someone feel like crap when they're 30. Um, and, but they'll never be diagnosed. I mean, the, the other thing is, and you kind of hinted at this when you were describing what Tommy says, but even in children with severe metabolic disorders, it is still the case that these organic acids are highly variable and are only reliable in a metabolic crisis. And so the and there there are no reference ranges that are that are for adults. All reference ranges for that are used. This might not be true for Genova. They probably do like a ninety fifth percentile thing with their client with their you know patient population or something like that. But the if you look at the the reference ranges that are used for like LabCorp, Quest, organic acid uh, panels, these are derived from pediatric cases where the uh, where the where even those pediatric cases will only have re markers reliable out of the reference range in the pattern that is diagnostic for that disease in a metabolic crisis. So, so you, you know, so if they're not, you know, vomiting in the parking lot when they're going to LabCorp, uh, you might not get the, the classic so-called pathognomonic um, collection of organic acids. And I, I've, I have a, I have quite a number of, of, you know, a lot of people, come to me for consulting when they went through like 10 doctors and couldn't figure out what their problem was. And so for years, I've had people who have really obvious late onset inborn errors of metabolism who will have obvious abnormalities on their, uh, whether it's organic acids or it's acyl carnitine profile or whatever it is, one of these panels for rare inborn errors of metabolism, they'll have obvious markers off on them but the but the people who run the uh, the clinical genetic departments, uh, the, the the people who are are in charge of diagnosing people, are totally out of touch with the fact that no one has any idea what this looks like in an adult who has onset at forty or fifty years old, and so therefore they they say like yes this is out of range that's out of range yes your symptoms line up but you don't have this classic cookie cutter pattern that was designed for six month olds. And so I can't do anything for you. And they send them off. 
Um, and so, so the, so first of all, no one has any idea what the prevalence of late on a very late onset inborn errors of metabolism, but it's got to be way higher than the severe ones that cause seizures in six months old. That's just obvious because it's less going to, it's not going to be filtered out at the same rate. It's going to be allowed to proliferate more. But also if you take all of the thousands of rare inborn errors of metabolism, you add them up together collectively, they're not that rare. I mean, even, even uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiencies, 8% of the world's population, all of the people who have uh, defects in the HFE gene for hemochromatosis, they might not be diagnosed hemochromatosis, but, but they're collectively 8% of the world's population. So if you take all these like 0.1%, 0.5%, 0.01%, you just add them up all together over hundreds of thousands of diseases, and you just assume that the very late onset versions that no one has any idea of the prevalence are several times as common as the severe ones, you're talking about probably like 10, 20% of people who have relevant, like, you know, at least have carriers. The other thing is you can have, you can have someone who has carrier status of two different diseases and it interacts in a way that causes just as a severe case as the others, but it doesn't cause any of the, the, the classical, um, it doesn't cause the markers to deviate in a way that would cause any diagnosis of anything, but they're just as severely affected. So I actually think that the percentage of, um, of, of people who have some degree of some of these disorders that he's talking about is not actually rare. And it's, and I, I think it, I think it does everyone a collective disservice to say, this is rare. I don't need to pay attention to it. I mean, I've talked to doc, like I had, I did a panel of discussion of people who had just gotten out of medical school on my podcast once. And one of them was like, yeah, the, like it was so worthless how much time we spent on these rare diseases because they're so rare and we're never going to see them in our clinic. I think that's the complete opposite uh, uh, idea that we should have. What we should be thinking is there's a genetic disorder of methylmalonic acidemia that is quite rare, but the same thing happens to you if you're B12 deficient. And so we should look at the con continuity between the symptoms of this genetic disorder in the B12 dependent enzyme and the B12 deficiency and how those things interact. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say is whenever I read these panels, I always ignore the interpretive part in the first like five pages. <laughs> I think their algorithm is insanely useless uh, and completely misleading. And it seems to me what they do is they take a score and they say like, well, this enzyme is dependent on lipoic acid, thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin. So if you have that organic acid a little bit out of the range, we're going to give you three points for that on each of these four vitamins. And then they just go down the list and they add up some score and they're like, you're this much deficient in lipoic acid. You're th that's asinine, the way they do that. And I understand what they're doing because they don't have the, the manpower to apply sophisticated analysis to this and they need a computer to, to do something. But you know, if, if anyone is using that and frustrated with the interpretive part, they should be. Because the interpretive part isn't that good. I think, I think a sophisticated analysis of the actual data is how I would use it. So anyway, I'll turn it back to you. Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show. So please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Click the subscribe button now and enjoy the rest of the episode. I wanted to make a point about our discussion earlier about, you know, it seems like I'm working on uh, fixing a problem versus you're more interested in just optimizing performance. I think a great perspective on this can be taken from athletic training. And I'm, I'm not a, I am not, uh, you know, that athletic training is outside my wheelhouse. Um, and I have some experience being just like a client of trainers as a result of that. So I read this book called advances in functional training by Michael Boyle way back in the day. Cause I was listening to some fitness podcast. And one of the things that he mentioned as a high level, at, um, professional athlete coach is that your top priority should not be maximal sports specific performance it should be injury prevention and then after that he didn't mention this but um Inigo San Milan was 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 talking about this about how you probably really want to emphasize your aerobic base 
before you're emphasizing your sport specific performance. That's kind of another topic. But on injury prevention, the thing is, let's say you are optimizing performance. You're always focusing on optimizing performance and you're always getting because you're so concerned with optimizing performance, you're pushing out your max performance at a rate of maybe 30 percent per year when you're when you're new and then it goes down to five percent per year or whatever. But you're you're accumulating and compounding benefits right now. Say you get injured and you're out for three months. You could lose three years of progress because of that of that injury, even though it doesn't happen that often. Right. So his argument is that your training program should first and foremost be designed to all never get injured. You know, you're not going to get never. But if you can get as close to never injured as possible, then you're better off making 2% progress per year and never getting injured than 5% progress per year and getting injured each year. And I have a, I have a, a personal example of this. So when I was doing CrossFit, I was squatting and one of the trainers noticed that I had um, my femur was running into my hips. He called it femoral acetabular impingement. I have since worked with a physical therapist who said, I don't really have that in terms of the bone and we can work on it to fix it. But I didn't know that at the time. And the lesson at the time was you shouldn't try to squat quite as much as everyone else is because your bone is just running into your hip in the way things are going now. So I later took an, a nighttime Olympic lifting class with a coach who didn't know me as well and was pushing me too hard. And because I'm not an expert, I was, I'm just doing what the coach says. And he says, squat deeper, squat deeper. And I squat deeper. And I don't know what injury I got, but it sounded like my left hip. It sounded like my knuckle. I had cracked all my knuckles. Only the degree to which the hip is bigger than the, than the knuckle is how louder it was. Right. So it was, it sounded like I had cracked all my knuckles, but at oh, 20 wow. times louder. And I, I, and that led to, I, I was like limping for a while. I, you know, I did things to heal from it, but I was basically out of squatting for three or four months. Right. And so when I went back to squatting, I wasn't making the new progress that I was made, that I was, that I, you know, I didn't start where I left off. I started way behind. And so, you know, there are many times where my, you know, primary focus, I would say more than often than not, my primary focus with my supplement regime or my fitness regime is how do I push my performance to the next level? But what I'm doing with this biotin thing is I believe in my mind because of what I found that this might be the sort of like under, under the hood, the, the, the thing that would be make me most vulnerable to having a big problem that's going to set me back, right? Like, I, and I, you know, I take things for like optimal cognitive performance, but if I'm not also very mindful of the things that might lead to a neurological disorder, then what good is it for me to have, you know, optimal cognitive performance if I'm going to wind up with a neurological disorder, right? So, so I, uh, I think it's a case by case basis, but I think you always want to be balancing maximal performance with with injury prevention, and that should include biochemical injury prevention as well as as you know physical injury prevention. I I completely agree with that, and and the corollary would be like you know do no harm first with uh, whatever you're doing, right? Take be, do very low risk stuff. Uh, you don't need to go crazy to achieve you know a couple more percentage yeah. points and, and set yourself back. Let me give let me give one example of how that of how that might play out with me. If if I've had mild bio de deficiency all my life and I get sick and I use up vitamins A and D and I'm always throwing vitamins A and D into the system to try to try to prevent getting more sick, I'm constantly slapping band aids on the problem, thinking that I have this high need for vitamin A with the potential to overdo it. Which you know, as we know, we everyone acknowledges that there's a syndrome of vitamin A toxicity, right? And so getting to the root of something under the hood that could be like on more on the injury prevention side might make me blow through a lot less vitamin A and D in the future. So that's that's one illustration okay. of how, how that might work. And, and how, I mean, let's let, I actually want to talk about the immune system and nutrients yeah. related to that, because I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, I want to start with how. How often do you get sick a year, let's say? I I would say. Um, I, 
Well, it changed in the era of COVID. So I got COVID in a in what I would say was a very meaningful way twice. Um, I you know I've I've kind of refined a cold prevention technique so that I can tell I'm getting sick and I never get sick. So I would say that like I never get a full blown cold, but I probably get um something that looks like it would materialize into a cold if I did nothing about it, like at least three or four times a year. See, so, okay, but in, in uh, but you got COVID, but let's say besides COVID, how often do you, would you get a, a flu type situation? Never. Uh, I have not gotten the flu until, in fact, when I, when I got COVID, um, I actually, I, I made a, my girlfriend at the time, I made a bet with her. I made, I bet her $10,000, which neither of us had. But I was so confident I would never get the flu again. I I told her I, I'll give you ten thousand dollars if I get the flu, and and we thought that um, when I got COVID the first time around it hadn't been spreading yet. It was like it was when there were a couple cases upstate New York it, uh, got probably got infected um, January twenty twenty and then and then got 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 COVID February twenty twenty and she had gotten the flu vaccine and I didn't and so I was like oh it must be the flu. It later turned out that that it, it almost certainly was COVID, but. I, I haven't gotten the flu since I was a teenager and I can't get COVID anymore either. So I've, I've been in two cases. Why where, can't you get COVID anymore? Because I'm so immune to it. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, last winter, my, my whole family got COVID and my mom got her first case of COVID. It was almost certainly Omicron. And I stayed with my mom in close contact, stayed over her house for three days. I took zero precautions. I hugged her. The only thing I didn't do was kiss her. But I did hug her plenty, um, and and I I was taking care of her. There's no way that if I could have gotten COVID, I didn't. I went away, and I had a mild sore throat um, that developed during that time. I swabbed my nose twice with a rapid antigen test, and it was negative. I bet you anything, if I swabbed my throat, it would have been positive, and that mild sore throat was my third case of COVID. But then at at a conference this summer, I I when we when we got back for, so. During the conference, I started sneezing and I put one spray of betadine into each nostril and I take one zinc acetate lozenge and the sneezing stops. I'm then in a karaoke room with like 30 people in a tight karaoke room. Hours go by where we are arm in arm, singing at the top of our lungs on top of each other, doubtlessly inhaling and spreading all kinds of respiratory droplets. I go okay. home and I go on Facebook and I see that everyone in the karaoke room is showing their positive test for COVID. And I, and I wasn't sick. I, I believe the sneezing that I did that was abolished by one spray of betadine and one zinc acetate lozenge was my fourth case of COVID. Um, and I don't, call, I don't consider that a case of COVID. Like I didn't get sick. Right. For sure not. And so I, I worry when I have not been exposed to COVID. Like I, I, my anxiety now is no longer about whether I might be exposed to COVID. It's what if I what if I haven't gotten an opportunity to to get exposed to COVID recently to keep my immunity up? Because if I if I'm so immune that that a case of COVID is two sneezes, like why why the hell would I want to lose that immunity? You know, but right. I, but I, I I think COVID is it just I think it's everywhere. I think you you have to lock yourself in your house to not get. You could probably lock yourself in your house and you still would get exposed to COVID because there's probably like viral fragments around your house from before you locked yourself in it. But for sure. Yeah. And so zinc acetate, I saw you write somewhere that that's better than the zinc gluconate. Is that true? Well, there's a lot more to it than that. So, um, yes, that's it's twice as good. But both of them are worthless if you chew it up and swallow it. So mm -hmm. you, the, the whole principle of if you want good zinc status going into getting an infection because you've been, you've had good zinc status for the last two years, um, that will, that will decrease, that will improve your immune response and it will decrease the duration of your sickness, but you cannot increase your systemic zinc status in a matter of hours or days. It's, so it's totally worthless to take to pop zinc pills when you get um when you get sick because it's it's there's just no time to improve your zinc status at that point. Hmm. What you can do is you can 
get the antiviral benefit of zinc ions by sucking on a lozenge that is designed to ionize in the mouth and spread throughout the nose and throat tissue. And zinc acetate is twice as good as zinc gluconate in doing that, but it's only good if it's not candied, doesn't have binders and and stuff in it, and it and it you let it dissolve for thirty minutes in your mouth every two hours. Has your immune system has your immune system always been good in adolescence? I think my immune system sucks, but I but I think okay. I just have very good specific immunity to to COVID and flu. I, mm-hmm. I, I honestly what makes you think your immune crap. system sucks like what makes so you I, get that I, I know a lot of people that get sick like every two months it's it's not like uh even uncommon i'm like that but i never but i never actually get sick because i have a cold prevention protocol that works what what's the full cold provo- uh, prevention protocol well i don't usually don't use it because the the step one is so effective so step one is to suck on zinc acetate lozenges and to run povidone iodine through my nose, you have to look. You have to be proactive enough to recognize that that you know the first suspicious sneeze is a symptom. You know, if you're convinced you have a cold, you you probably had symptoms for like two days, mm. and that and then it's probably useless to try to prevent viral replication because you already hit peak. Interesting. This is really interesting. I'm I'm but like I don't, this I don't is do that. If I get a sneeze that's that I find suspicious. Uh, I'll at least, it, you know, it depends how suspicious it is. But if I if I have one sneeze and that in a outside the context of what seems like a normal sneeze to me, I'll just spray some betadine into my nose and it'll probably go away. Um, you know, but, what what I'll, else is part of like what are some of your top hacks in the initial stage? Zinc acetate, uh, betadine, an antiseptic, and zinc acetate is the is the full like level one biohack. What about a betadine uh, throat spray? Is that something that interests you or, or only the nasal? Does it have to be through the nose? What's the benefit through the nose rather than through the mouth? Um, I mean, just by, I think, I think if you just look at like the prevalence of, of nasal symptoms versus throat symptoms, I, I think it's pretty clear that the, that it varies, but the standard balance favors a cold being more important in the nose than the throat. But look, if, so you're saying, symptom, if your first symptom is a sore throat, that's not the case, you know. So, so you're saying go where the symptom is. So if you sneeze, yeah, I would go get it the in the nose. Yeah, I think that's totally if, fair, yeah. If you cough, get it yeah. in the yeah, but throat. Look, look if, if you have a whole system set up, like you've got the nasal irrigation with the 0.5% iodine, you can do all of it, right? So like the, co- the COVID protocol for povidone iodine was 30 seconds in one nostril, um, you know, spend half of it letting it fall out the other nostril if it will fall out. Spend the other half letting it go down the back of your throat. Then uh, rinse for 30 seconds in the mouth and gargle for 30 seconds in the mouth and you're covering everything, right? But if I'm, if I'm, tra- but my point is that if I'm traveling and I don't want to bring iodine with me and I have the, I, and I have the betadine nasal spray, mo- more often than not, like a couple extra squirts of that and it caught early has a, an incredible, exceedingly good effect. And since I'm more vulnerable to colds than COVID, when I get COVID, it just, but, uh, you know, but if it's a cold, it might, it might take more sprays. So th- this povidone iodine or betadine, you basically spray in your nose and you, you want to like kind of rinse it all over. You want it to be in the back on all Nasal different irrigation. sides. That's what you do. Yeah. Nasal irrigation. And yeah. So let's say somebody, because there's people who get sick all the time. I mean, it's something that I've wanted to improve. I think because of COVID, I, I got more sick in the past couple of years. I probably got COVID like three times. Um, and so that kind of added to, and that's something I want to improve. So I think I got COVID three times, maybe a flu, a couple colds. So let's get to um, what happens if, if, like, how do you, if if, let's say somebody got past, like, the the illness got past your prevention protocol. What would you be doing? Like, what are yeah, the nutrients so, that you would make sure that you have enough of? I know that there's obviously zinc. If if you go to chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com and you click on eBooks, the top one is called "Staying Through the Staying Immune Through the Winter," and it is um it's free to ever it's free to everyone, and it basically um basically covers this, but um. So I'm just, I'm just, I just opened it up and I'm just going to go through it. So, uh, in the stocking the cabinets essentials, 
uh, part. You got the antiseptic rinse. You have, and by the way, there are some contraindications for povidone iodine, and the guide runs through that. But uh, thyroid disorders and pregnancy and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, antiseptic so got, rinse is is the uh, nasal irrigation with yeah, the one point five percent iodine. I would, yep, but I would in, I would include the betadine cold defense spray in that because that's okay. Sort of alternatives to each other, um, and then the life extension enhanced zinc acetate lozenges are the best on the market for a uh, for zinc lozenges like we were talking about before, and then vitamins A and D are are the are the next most important thing. If somebody has like let's say my serum vitamin A, do you think you should still take vitamin A? Yeah. Or or my serum vitamin D. My serum vitamin D is sixty one nanograms per deciliter, which is I don't think anyone would say that that's not high. I, yeah, I would I would say I would say it would be optional. Well, I mean, first of all, I would I would expect you to get sick less as a result of that. Um, but I bet you anything that if you measure your serum levels over the course of an illness, you know, let's say you don't. And by the way, this, I, like I said before, if you do the first step one uh, appropriately, you you shouldn't need step two. Um, and so if if your if you, your nutrient status is very well optimized, and so your immune function is really good, and then you also add step one when you think you're getting sick, you're probably not going to wind up in a position where you're doing vitamins A and D that much. But I bet you anything, if you do get a full blown illness, that you're going to watch your your serum levels of those vitamins drop rapidly through the first few days and if you let mm. it get very serious it's just going to keep going down so we have actually really good data for vitamin d um good good not in the sense of like many many study large studies but good in terms of um pre versus post covid levels in the same people and also day one icu day three icu in the same people and we know from those studies that when someone gets covid you know, your vitamin D gets like cut in half by the time you get a positive test. And then it's mm. just, if you're in the ICU, it's just dro rapidly dropping every day. So I do think that- What, what about those studies that sh that don't show any benefit uh, in COVID by taking vitamin D supplements? This is this is basically the, the what matters in the vitamin D COVID research. So um, if, if, when you have a severe inflammatory condition, you are compromising the 25 hydroxylation of vitamin D in the liver. And even if you do not have a severe inflammatory condition, a single bolus dose of 100,000 or 200,000 IU of vitamin D takes five days for it to maximize your plasma 25 OHD. Okay. So if you have someone who comes in on their 10th day of COVID to the ICU or you know, to the hospital and, and they're likely to wind up in the ICU, and they've been sick for 10 days. And you give <laughs> and them it a takes bolus. another 10 days, five right. days. You give, yeah. if, you, if they were healthy, it would take five days for that bolus to, to kick in. It may take 15 days, right? So they're on day 30 by the time they're getting their, their maximal 25 OHD benefit. This Obviously, it's not going to help. And so the studies that were positive were the ones that used 25 OHD, cal calcifidiol, as a supplement on, on the working hypothesis that because 25 hydroxylation would be impaired, it would take hours to get their 25 OHD up. And those were massively successful. And you can, you know, the, the evidence, uh, the evidence-based internet trolls or EBITs, as I call them, will, will, they'll like just blindly follow the, the pyramid that, that someone, not, not the founders of evidence-based medicine, but some, some dipshit who's good at graphics was like, oh, here's a good way to convey this. Let's go look at the pyramid and they'll be like, huh, um, one human study, uh, way below systematic review, way below meta. And now like, you don't have any evidence. And the thing is like, you have to look at the differences between the studies and you have to consider the mechanisms involved before you say, what is the type of evidence that we need? And there's actually quite a body, of, uh, quite, if you take the totality of respiratory viruses the evidence is pretty good that that vitamin d does something but even then if you if you use a mechanistic framework like why is it helping and you go back to what i said there's a synergistic interaction between a and d that no one is testing so the 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 the, the things the negative trials are they're interesting for the what they tested but they're not they're not pushing the knowledge gap further because 
everyone's just trying to pile on to get their vitamin D uh, study published. And they're not trying to say like, what is the next most important thing we need to know to reconcile the, the conflicting trials? So, so first of all, um, all the it's vitamin D metabolites, which is, you know, anything broke metabolized from vitamin D, uh, they, their terminology is confusing because they all have multiple names, but 25 OHD is also called calcidiol. And it's called calcidiol because there's a functional group called an alcohol group on it. And there's two of them. Calcitriol is, is a calcium related, uh, triol, meaning it has three of those groups. Um, and that's one twenty one twenty five dihydroxy vitamin D is another name for it. Um, the standard view is that 25 OHD is basically a storage, circulating storage form that is a reservoir for mainly the kidney, but to a lesser degree, other cells to produce 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active hormone form that acts on the vitamin D receptor and carries out all the biological activity. That, Correct. that view is wrong. Um, it's, a, it's sort of like by and large kind of in a simple, a reasonable simplification, but it, but it's not actually true because 25 OHD has 1,000 times less activity on the vitamin D receptor, but it's present at 1,000 times higher concentration. So probably uh. the two of them are roughly equally contributing to biological vitamin D activity. And because the units are a thousand fold different and the concentrations are a thousand fold different and the activity is a thousand fold different, just by coincidence of mathematics, I believe you could just add the two values together and come up with a biological activity of vitamin D index that would be superior to 25 OHD. But now we get to the point where you were talking about before, I'd rather have something that had all this research behind it. And there's thousands of studies on 25 OHD that can go back and look at that. And the, the argument for measuring 25 OHD is not that it's easier. It's that there's a semi-linear response of 25 OHD to status. So that as your vitamin D status goes up, you don't get a linear 25 OHD going up, but you do get like a curvilinear um, where like if you take more vitamin D, you're going to get a higher level. And the more you take, the more it's going to start to level off, but it really does keep going up. Uh, you can't see my finger on this. It's going to keep going up until you're in the toxic range. And so that calcitriol is very regulated and it does not go easily up or down with what you supplement with. And so the view is that that is a, a good marker of nutritional status because it corresponds to what people are taking for supplements or what their sunlight and food is producing. Um, but, but my view is that it's, it's probably not, it shouldn't be seen as a reservoir for 125 so much as the conversion to 125 should be seen as switching, like switching the dial one way or the other in terms of fine tuning the vitamin D biological activity. But that's my view and it's not shared by many other people. So there are no studies you know, you go back to saying you want, I want what my scientists can go out and look in the litter. You're not going to find that index in there at all. Um, but I, but I think it would probably be the best way to look at to, to, if I were doing a Mendelian randomization study, I would, I would, I would, if I were doing any vitamin D study, I would say, okay, let's measure both. What happens if we look at 25 OHD? What happens if we look at 125? What happens if we sum them together and, and use this putative index and which one outcompetes which? Unfortunately, we can't go back to so many studies, but I, I hope people start doing that in the future to, to test out that, that index or something. So like would you, so, uh, is that one of the tests that you would do the 125, the calcium trial? Yes. Yeah, so if you go to testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, the calcium and vitamin D section, uh, the most basic triad of tests is calcidiol, which is 25 OHD one, uh, calcium trial, which is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and parathyroid hormone or PTH. And I, I would, and actually there are COVID studies that support measuring calcitriol and PTH alongside that, but I would never, I would never measure 25 OHD without measuring calcitriol and PTH. I think it gives you too little information. Interesting. Okay. Let's go back to this protocol. So we're, we're at the vitamin A and D. You're basically saying that even if you're not deficient, your body can, you know, can significantly lower the levels of these of, of these uh, vitamins, so you want to make sure that you're getting enough of them. What what else is on that sheet that you think is like pretty important? Um, yeah, I mean, we're now getting into uh, sort of stage three. Um, so a source of omega three fatty acids such as cod liver oil, fish oil, algal DHA for vegans or fish, 
a source of omega-6 fatty acids such as egg yolks and liver, or an arachidonic acid supplement, which is derived from a certain mushroom. A uh, source of whole food vitamin C providing 200 or 250. Wait, why, why is the omega-6 important? Uh, because, because it's, because prostaglandins are central to immune function. And but most people have enough omega-6s, no? No. Uh, okay. So first of all, you, you have to distinguish between seed oils and arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is what is essential in the body. There's no, there's no clear utility for linoleic acid, which is a plant oil. Um, I would argue there's really no clear utility to any omega-6 except arachidonic acid. Isn't there a bad rap of uh, arachidonic acid? Like some people think it's the devil yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. that, you know, could cause inflammation because oh, yeah. Barry it Sears, turns into these the prostaglandins. The diet would be, Barry Sears, the author of The Zone Diet, was the popularizer of arachidonic acid as the bad fat. Okay. And you think that that's mistaken? I think it's totally unambiguous that arachidonic acid is used up to make prostaglandins in the immune response and depleted in the immune response and that prostaglandins are needed to initiate inflammation, which is what you want when you get sick, and okay. are also needed to initiate the resolution of inflammation when you get better. Look, what you want is well-regulated arachidonic acid. Like your body shouldn't be randomly making prostaglandins for fun if you don't have a, a reason to make them. So it should be just sitting there for storage. Uh, so if the body's regulating it, you, you, you think there's a benefit of adding eggs and liver to increase the arachidonic acid? I think the benefit of eggs and liver is just so overwhelming on so many other fronts. So let's go, let's go uh, through that list, the stage three, as you call it. So stage one is the yeah, antiseptic rinse. To be clear, sequencing. I don't have separate stages in the, in the <laughs> protocol, to, 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 but, but anyway. Um, yeah. So whole, whole food vitamin C providing 200 or 250 milligrams per dose. Uh, whey protein. Why whole food and not just vitamin because C? Because there's so much other stuff in the whole foods and because the doses that you get from whole food supplements are usually good. So if you, you know, if you're buying ascorbic acid powder, the, the benefit of ascorbic acid powder is it's a cheap way to get like gram amounts, but there's, there's no scientific basis for getting gram amounts when you're sick. What about, I, I bought a uh, slow release vitamin C, which I feel like has benefits and uh, yeah, I don't know if I've seen a slow release whole food vitamin C. So what do you think of, of something like that? Me? I have seen it studied that if you take 200 milligrams twice a day sp you know, once in the morning and once in the evening, that's where you're getting maximal utilization of vitamin C. Um, and, you know, when you take higher doses, you're getting a spillover effect into oxalate, urinary oxalate, and you are getting, you know, radically diminishing returns in terms of boosting blood cell levels. So, you know, maybe you're stretching that out if you are taking a, a time release. I, I don't know. Um, you. I don't, I don't know. It'd be very, it'd be very interesting to look at your urinary oxalate on that and your lymphocyte vitamin C concentrations, you know, taking that versus taking, uh, the equivalent amount of a powder or something like that. Okay. So, uh, moving forward, uh, the, after the whole food vitamin C, what, what, what else do you have? Um, whey protein or raw milk. That's, that's a good, as a glutathione boost, uh, collagen, gelatin, or bone broth. That's a good complement for the glutathione boost. Um, and then there's two throat things. So Gaia Throat Shield, that is just in my experience, the the best uh, throat soother if you have a sore throat. And I put Element on here, which is the salt heavy electrolyte. You can make your own Element at home. Uh, you know, some people see it as overpriced salt, but I think it's a very easy way to get uh, salt in. And a lot of people gargle with salt with a sore throat as an antimicrobial. But my big discovery in my first case of COVID was that my sore throat was completely caused by dehydration and that, mm -hmm. it, and that, um, and that getting salt using element, uh, cause I had a bunch of it, uh, what, because I had a diminution of my sweet taste, the only way I could stand anything was, a, was with a sweet taste that made it taste normal. And the salt was what helped me start to retain water. And so I think a, a salty gargle as well as salted water can be just a drink can be very beneficial for people who have a sore throat because I think a dehydration of the throat is a is an underappreciated contributor to it.
What about eating something like pickles and olives? Is that good enough? Good enough for what? Because it's salty? Like the salt, yeah. Uh, I Probably not, but pr- it would probably be beneficial. Um, Why probably the, not? Well, I mean, you what? can just get more salt if you're like putting a gram in your water. But yeah, but you, you might, I mean, if you eat enough of them, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like if you just pick out on 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 olives and pickles and depends how your pickles okay. are made, but if they're made with salt, right? right. They, they, most of them, with yeah. Salt, but right. Well, some okay. Of them are made, some of the fake pickles are made with vinegar, and the fake pickles right. Are... I'm talking about the real pickles, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, you can start it with whey and use a lot less salt. So it depends if they use a starter or not. Okay. So um, we got salt. You're saying salt, and is that also heavy? Uh, is that also important? Is that important for the immune system, or is that more fighting the uh, bacteria or infections itself? I'm see, I'm salt as a my sp- antimicrobial. I'm, spe- I'm specifically getting at it in a in a dehydration context, okay. but you know, salt is necessary for everything. I mean, you can't absorb anything of salt. Okay. Yeah. All right. So moving on, we got salt. What else? Uh, that's it for stocking the cabinets, and the rest of my guide is is uh, is about uh, eating healthy in general, and then like a protocol for what to do when you get sick with the doses and stuff like that. So if you want, we can- what about nutrients? Right, there's a whole bunch of nutrients that are important for immunity, and oh, a are. lot of those are the B there vitamins, are. right? Look, there are, there are, but but um, and that's that's why part of the after you stock your cabinets in this guide, there's advice about how to get all the nutrients from food because. Every there's no nutrient that's not important to the to the immune system. The thing is, if you look at, I have a, which are the most important. Let's say though, well, it's not which are the most important. It's which are the fastest you burn through. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, because because something can be absolutely critical to the immune system, but if you if you don't burn through it when you get sick, that you're probably not going to get much benefit from supplementing with it, unless. It is something like zinc where you have a way of delivering ions to the nose and throat through a specific vehicle that can have an antimicrobial effect. Um, so if, if, you look at, if you look at all the – if you just take something like the oxidative burst, you, you have um, – you've got arginine to make nitric oxide. You've got vitamin C and uh, – especially vitamin C and glutathione to protect the BH4 cofactor in nitric oxide synthase. Um, you've got zinc as a cofactor for nitric oxide synthase. You've got um, superoxide dismutase and catalase and myeloperoxidase, which are using, and superoxide dismutase, which are, which are all combining to collectively make this spectrum of uh, microbicides. By the way, I, I just want to, mentioned that um some of the best things for my immune system were actually niacin biotin and thymine i found that once i started taking those the frequency of getting like i just feel my immune system working way better right and and it's kind of like if i don't get sleep there's a couple ways i i test for that but um those are some just interesting tidbits my slides here will explain that so okay all right so the if you look at what's What's in red? What is in red are the are the types of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species that are used that you use to kill microbes. And so you have superoxide, nitric oxide, peroxynitrite, hypochlorous acid, which is literally bleach. That's what chlorox <laughs> okay. bleach is, and hydrogen peroxide, which most people have beneath their counters. And in order to make these things, superoxide and nitric oxide combine spontaneously together to make peroxynitrite. But where are you getting superoxide? You're getting it from the NADPH oxidase, which is a riboflavin and niacin. And riboflavin is B2, niacin is NADPH. This is for, for, for um, if you can't see my cursor, this is the bottom left of the screen. So not, this is niacin and riboflavin making uh, as cofactors for NADPH oxidase to make the superoxide. Where do you get the nitric oxide? You have the amino acid arginine in the upper right corner. Uh, is getting converted to citrulline by nitric oxide synthase, which has a cofactor called BH4, which is the abbreviation for tetrahydrobiopterin. And vitamin C is needed to protect it. And the role of vitamin C in the oxidative burst is to protect the BH4 cofactor. 
Um, and so it's an antioxidant that is allowing the cofactor to function for this prooxidant enzyme. What if uh, you just take citrulline, for example? Would that help preventing to get sick? Uh, cit citrulline will get converted to arginine in the kidney, and the arginine will become uh, circulate and become available to the immune cells so that could help. Um, and okay. uh, once again, you have... Uh, so would you supplement with that, let's say? You could, um, and in, but... Uh, you could, and in fact, um, arginine does get uh, depleted if you. So vitamins A and D is. Um, I don't want to go back up to those slides, but let me just say that if you have, if you don't have enough vitamins A and D, you will have the MDSCs that we talked about before that are suppressing T cells. The way they suppress T cells is to deplete your arginine levels, and so they're they're also gonna they're also going to prevent this aspect of the oxidative burst. Uh, and and repleting the arginine with arginine or citrulline would help. I do think because the MDSCs can suppress arginine levels, I'm not sure what they do to the conversion of citrulline to arginine. So usually I would support supplementing citrulline to boost your arginine levels. But in someone who's sick, I'm I'm skeptical that that always plays out that way. And I, I think arginine might be better, even though it okay. has lower bioavailability. But with recycling vitamin C, you have niacin again, and you have glutathione coming in there. And then if you look at the nutrients involved in, in recycling NADPH, um, you have vitamin B6, which is releasing glycogen. The release of glycogen in the immune cells is what's driving the glucose used in the pentose phosphate pathway, which depends on thiamine, calcium, and magnesium as cofactors. Thiamine is vitamin B1 to support the riboflavin utilization of niacin to support the NADPH oxidase enzyme as well as the glutathione reductase this enzyme. Is this is really interesting. I'll tell you why. Um, I haven't noticed clearly that the riboflin has been helping me, but uh, in Self Decode, it, it did mention that um, I have a higher need for riboflavin, so I started taking it. So, okay, so these are antioxidants. The other thing that you need them for is to, is to uh, protect against the irreversible loss of niacin that would, that would occur if the oxidative burst were causing DNA damage. So, Usually, what these what usually the oxidative burst is confined to a specific compartment of the cell, where, for example, in a phagocytic cell, the phagosome, if it eats uh, a bacterium, that bacterium gets swallowed into the phagosome, and all the enzymes of the oxidative burst are facing the inside of the phagosome to create all the oxidative damage inside the phagosome. Meanwhile, the antioxidant protection is needed for the rest of the cell, and any NAD. Uh, NADH is irreversibly hydrolyzed um, in, in the re DNA repair process. And if you oxidatively damage DNA, uh, you will irreversibly lose niacin um, and you will lose the capacity for the oxidative burst. And so this slide is just making the point that all, the whole antioxidant um, network is, is needed. And so you have manganese, copper, zinc, iron, glutathione, selenium, their vitamin E and C. Um, okay. And so this, th just the last point to round this out, um, you know, we talked about uh, the pentose phosphate pathway before and all those nutrients for glutathione recycling, but glutathione synthesis is ATP dependent. So you have magnesium and then you have uh, all of the B vitamins. So you mentioned biotin. If you, if you run low in biotin, you need biotin for adequate ATP production and you need ATP to synthesize glutathione. And iron, copper, sulfur, literally all of the B1 through B12, and et cetera. So I, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, that's that's the gist of of where all those different nutrients come into play. And you need all of them. Um, but to to get back to the point I said before, not all of these are equally blown through. And so the signaling compounds are the things that are blown through fastest. And that's because if you look at the half life of any hormone. Like if you just look at even even 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is a hormone form of vitamin D. That half life of that is really quick because it's used to signal something, and you can't have just because you if you want to signal that you want something now, you don't want that signal to last forever because you want it to last long enough to signal what you do, what you need. So all signaling compounds are are catabolized very quickly, and vitamins A and D are signaling compounds in the myeloid differentiation, so they are blown through very rapidly. The fatty acids, arachidonic acid and and DHA, 
arachidonic acid through the whole time, DHA specifically in resolution there, blown through very rapidly in regulating the inflammatory process. So those those things are uh, those things are are blown through very fast. The redox factors are vulnerable to being degraded because what they're doing is is an oxidative liability, but they're not purposefully blown through, right? So vitamin C is not purposefully degraded during this process, but because it is a redox reactive compound and it is in this cesspool of oxidant production, you are probably going to lose vitamin C when you're sick. You're just not going to it's not like vitamin A, where every time you activate the molecule for a split second of signaling, you're going to catabolize it and lose the catabolites in the urine. It's not like that. But it is, you are going to marginally lose vitamin C when you're sick. And so I think that's what my tiering for the key things is based on. It's not, you know, if you, I think I need biotin to not get sick because I think I have a biotin transporter defect. And I think you have new, like we were talking about before, I think you have several things with biotin and niacin especially that that make you need more and so yes you might find that for you those supplements are the central things that stop you from getting sick more than you should um and i might find something similar for me but as a general uh as a general protocol the average person the, the things that are most common are when you are going through the first th three days of a of an actual real illness to its completion. You will blow through vitamins A and D. You will marginally need more vitamin C. And so you can go through the list and that's how I constructed. What else are you blowing through besides arginine, DHA, vitamin A, vitamin D? So if you have the C A and D, bit. you're not going to blow through the arginine. You are, yes, you, yes, you are catabolizing arginine to make nitric oxide. That's true. So, um, you know, but, but you're, you're generating citrulline. It's going to go back to the urea cycle. It's going to get reconverted to arginine using ammonia from amino acid breakdown of normal processes. So you're not irreversibly catabolizing the arginine at all. Why is the uh, glutathione, like glutathione is interesting because I, I hear it a lot in terms of preventing uh, colds and stuff like that. It's never helped with me. Like anytime I try to uh, uh, increase glutathione, I still got sick in the end. So but I, what I'm curious about is um, why is it so important? On the one hand, you want this oxidative stress to fight the microbes. On the other hand, the glutathione is getting rid of the oxidative stress. So why is the glutathione so important in the uh, defense against these microbes? You, I think a lot, of, a lot of people miss the key points when they don't think about the compartmentalization. And I think we've had a problem with this and we still have a problem with this when people think about antioxidants. They, you know, in the 1980s, uh, the, the prevailing view was that, in, that oxidative stress is a balance between pro-oxidants and antioxidants. And there are still people who think about it like this, which is total BS. And it's just, it was reasonable at the time, but now we understand compartmentalization so much better. And if you just go back to the, um, if you, if you just go back to the, uh, the respiratory burst, glutathione is, is necessary as a recycler of vitamin C, which preserves the BH4 cofactor of nitric oxide synthase and contributes to the oxidative burst. And the key thing that, that, that differentiates, and it's also protecting the cell, the, the, the difference between the oxidative burst and the protection of the cell is that the oxidative burst is driven into the phagosome, right? So it's, it's, um, the, you do the very similar thing in, uh, the thyroid gland. So thyroid hormone is produced in the thyroid follicle lumen, which is a specialized compartment. And you need hydrogen peroxide in order to make thyroid hormone. All of the pro, all of the enzymes that produce hydrogen peroxide have, are, have their catalytic, uh, their active sites that, that make the hydrogen peroxide facing the inside of the thyroid follicle lumen. So you don't have a lot of hydrogen peroxide um, in, the in the thyrocyte. You have it in the thyroid follicle lumen, which is outside the cells. It's like this hallway between all the thyrocytes. Um, and and you know, if you look at why does selenium prevent Hashimoto's, it's because it's a cofactor for glutathione peroxidase. Where are you using that? You're using glutathione, selenium, et cetera, for the antioxidant defense inside the thyrocyte because you're gonna have some leakage, mm -hmm. right? So with the immune system, you want all these high 
you want all the bleach inside the specialized compartments of pathogen killing, and you want all the protective components outside, and you can't. This is where the pharmacological model fails, right? And I, I think you kind of straddle the fence between thinking about the nutritional side and the pharmacological side. And, and sometimes you're kind of doing both, like with the riboflavin and the UV light and the other B vitamins. Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe it was a, for sure. maybe it was a antimicrobial block or the, the biotin two and a half milligrams. Is it a pharmacological effect or you're right. fixing the deficiency faster, right? The pharmacological model really fails when you look at the compartmentalization of opposite processes and you have no mechanism of compartment specific drug delivery, which is usually. Um, and so pharmacists like to think in biochemistry much more than they like to think in, uh, I mean, pharmacologists, pharmacologists like uh, drug developers like to think in terms of biochemistry much more than they like to think in terms of cellular localization or physiology. Um, be because I'm not saying they don't think about those things, but it's it's so easy to look at a biochemical pathway and just find something that inhibits a receptor or activates a receptor, put it in a pill and give it to someone. It is so utterly harder to say, I want this to activate this thing in one compartment and suppress it in another compartment. And you know when they try to do that, there's a lot of cutting edge technologies that are trying to do that. But these are these are you know they're along the lines of gene therapy and like prophylactic gene editing and things right. like that, where you're like, well, we can we can get this mRNA to produce this under certain conditions, and like this is all kinds of weird. Like you're going to be patented by the time they're good at that. Um, you know, we're we're going to be running on on operating systems of all the different gene edits that they have to do to make all the drugs work by the time we get to very good compartmentalization and contextualization of the drugs. So the thing with nutrition is you give your body what it needs and then your body decides where to put it. Mm -hmm. There's an element of trust that you, but look, the, the so body- you're saying, I, I, uh, to sum up what, what you're, I, and you can tell me if this is what you're saying, like if you're taking glutathione or you're taking things that are going to increase glutathione, right, which is more cysteine um, and you know, certain, uh, whether it's uh, glycine and certain other factors, you increase glutathione, your body is going to put that glutathione where it needs to be put, right? Now, I guess my question is, if you're having oxidative stress, like how smart is the body? So if you're having high oxidative stress in a certain area to fight infections, maybe your body's going to deliver the glutathione in those areas and prevent those oxidants from killing the microbes. Would you... Well, the body is neither infinitely smart nor infinitely competent. It's just a hell of a lot smarter, you know, in quotes, than we are um, when we're using our frontal lobes to figure this stuff out. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's there's always uh, there's always toxicity risks, imbalance risks, um, you know, uh, adverse uh, unintended consequences risks, and so on. Um, you know, but but my I think in, you don't have, I mean, you, you don't have an anecdotal experience from what you described that glutathione makes you get worse. No, um, no, and, yeah, I don't, and definitely I've, not. I've, I've, yeah. never, I've never heard that. I, there are people who can't tolerate glutathione, but I've, I've, never, I've never noticed any subset of people who, who are reporting specifically that their infectious disease prognosis gets worse when they supplement with glutathione or and, some other glutathione boosting thing. So. I think it, the spectrum is really, it helps or it doesn't help. Um, and it helps a lot or a little, depending on how much you need the glutathione boost. Sounds good. Uh, I think we, we got through quite a lot. I, I yeah. learned quite a lot on this podcast, as usual, from, from you. Um, you're, you're always a well of information. And thank you for coming on again. And Thanks for having me. So the best, the best thing for people to do would be to go to chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com and then in the menu, click on eBooks. And there's a list of my eBooks that are available there. Uh, there's actually so many now that you have to click see all at the bottom to, uh, wait, <laughs> do you have to do that? No, actually you don't have to do that. It doesn't do anything. Okay. Um, and uh, and pe there, I have a membership system called the Master Pass, and all of the eBooks are free to everyone um, if they join the Master Pass. But for uh, a la carte, the staying immune through the winter is a free guide. Uh, so I think everyone should hop on over and get that one for free because it's, it really is sort of like 
the most super useful stuff that I've co collated about immune health over the last you know 15 years of research. Mm -hmm. Then I have one specific on healing from COVID vaccine side effects, one on COVID in general, which is in its eighth edition called the COVID Guide, uh, testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, which we talked about. Um, there's a cheap 299, the vitamins and minerals 101 cliff notes. That's sort of like everything, all the essentials about each nutrient boiled down into bullet point format. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are then there, there are also there are also two reports on essential fatty acids and thyroid toxins that are not sold all the cart and that are only for MasterPass members that you'll see if you go to the ebooks. So it's mainly the uh, five those five. So vitamins and minerals one on one. Cliff notes, COVID guide, COVID vaccine guide, testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet, and the and the totally free staying immune through the winter. Awesome. I'm gonna go check those out, and I would recommend other people go check them out. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Joe. This was great. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. 